Good morning to you all. Um, let, me, let me start my presentation by telling you a small story. So this is the story of the friendly biology professor. Let's call him Dr. A. So Dr. A, he's a computational biologist. So basically what his job is, he runs these experiments, gets a whole bunch of numbers, and he has to crunch these numbers to you know, get to useful results. So his problem is, what is the best way to crunch my numbers? Now, Dr. A is lucky. He has many choices. So he has access to the in-house computing cluster in the school. School has an agreement with Microsoft, so he has access to uh, the Windows Azure Cloud. And of course, he can go for the Amazon Cloud if, if he wants. He has you know, enough funds to do that. Now, <coughs> this seems like <coughs> a perfect solution for him. So there are many choices. He, is, he, has, uh, he has a lot of computing power at, at his will. But there is an issue. The issue is, one, programming for the cloud is hard. So of course, Dr. A has to find out people who can you know, make use of the cloud. But more importantly, the, once you write these programs, these software stacks are not compatible. So what this means is this. Say Dr. A manages to get uh, you know, graduate students and write this uh, nice uh, parallel algorithm of his uh, process to run on Windows Azure. And uh, let's say a month later, the school uh, cuts down the Microsoft link, and then now there's no Azure anymore. He can't just take that program and run it on either Amazon or even on the internal cluster, which is actually the loop. He has to start from the beginning. So this is the problem that Dr. A is facing. So welcome to my uh, dissertation defense. My, what I'm trying to do in, in a nutshell is to try to help Dr. A do his thing much more efficiently, quickly, and nicely. So my thesis is on using abstractions to make cloud programs portable. Here's my value proposition. So what I'm saying is when you use carefully crafted abstractions to develop, deploy, and manage cloud applications, they will, you, you can use them in a platform agnostic manner. So <clears throat> let's look at this in three items. So basically, we are going to take a bird's eye view of how do we use abstractions, then we are going to deep dive into how do we use abstractions in programs and how do we use abstractions in cloud abstract cloud interaction so you know access in the cloud now before we start cloud in a nutshell most of you may have heard what cloud is but for just for the sake of completion let me give you a really brief introduction cloud started as a infrastructure service so yes which you can see on it. Yeah. Uh, so you have virtual machines, you have storage, you have networking, the raw computing resources on pay as you go basis. This was really the first cloud that came up. And then there was platform services. So platforms are different from infrastructure, infrastructure clouds because they offer these slots. The, uh, their focus is on the application slots. They don't care about VMs or your network or your storage. They just provide you a space to host your app, so you don't have to worry about you know, what OS am I running and uh, that kind of detail. Then there came software services. So the pioneer in this case is Salesforce. They basically put their CRM uh, uh, solution as a multi-tenant application on a cloud and offered that as a service to people. So then came up, that's how the software as a service paradigm came up. And now, there are many other as a service paradigms. So you get data as a service, you get analytics as a service, you get Hadoop as a service, if you know what Hadoop is already. So all of these things together is what is cloud right now. What seems to be the problem? The problem, as we just saw, is programming, but programming for the cloud and keeping the applications portable as well. How do we do this? This issue is typically called vendor locking because when, when people try to you know, write applications and use clouds, 
they are locked into these vendors in some way. So the popular term that they use is vendor locking. And vendor locking is, in fact, a major concern. Uh, this is a survey from a uh, technical survey company called Northbridge. And this, actually, this report actually came out uh, in June 2012, pretty recent. So they listed, as of now, the top 10 concerns for cloud adoption. And you can see that lock-in and interoperability are still on top five. This, this was slightly different uh, a year or two back, but still, they are still at the top five. And many people think that, you know, moving to the cloud, I might get locked in. And, you know, that's one of their major concerns. Okay, so let's move on to our meet. First, the overview of using abstractions. What is the bird's eye view of this whole abstraction business? First question, why abstract? Basically, we are trying to completely decouple the cloud from the application. So we see abstractions as a way of doing that. Given that, you come to this point, what, what, what do you abstract? What are the things or what are the activities that are best for this abstraction? Now, what we did was we looked at these places or we looked at this whole application development life cycle and looked at where you would get locked in to the cloud. Now, the first thing we noticed was that when you, when you are developing applications, there are, uh, depending on the cloud that you, you are targeting, you would have to use non-standard configuration files, so you would have to you know, adhere to certain uh, specific libraries or data storages. So there are many features that you have to use that are specific to the cloud when you develop. So this seemed like a uh, good activity that uh, for us to you know, try to apply abstractions to. Then deployment of cloud applications. When you say deployment, what I mean is you know, putting the app in the cloud and making it run. So in some clouds, say Google App Engine, this is just one command. You invoke uh, the app CFD tool that comes with the, the, the cloud SDK, and it's just one command to put there. But if you think of an infrastructure cloud like Amazon, then this is a chain of commands. So first you have to you know, select a machine image, then put in the right software, then you know, put in certain configuration files. So de depending on the cloud that you, you are trying to go to, you are getting locked in, in terms of deployment. So this also is a, seems like a candidate for us to you know, apply abstractions. Similarly, management of applications. You manage the app once after you deploy it. So the activities that comes under this are, you know, you can undeploy the app if, if you want to. There, or you can take data snapshots, or you can check status. Or there are many other uh, operations that you do on the applications once they're running. So depending on, again on the, the cloud platform or cloud environment that you are uh, hosting or you, you have your app on, the set of commands or set of operations differ. Okay, how do we abstract? How, how do we apply these abstractions in a, in a nutshell? Before we go into this, let's see what's the state of the art. What's, what's happening right now? So. <clears throat> There are abstraction-based application generators. I've, in, I've put them in two segments because you see that uh, the mobile application paradigm is coming up and mobile devices are hot and there are a lot of heterogeneous mobile devices. So the first and the most uh, popular application of abstractions in application generation you see in the mobile space. So you, you get uh, this, uh, the one, one of the first companies to do that is this one, Romobile. So they basically introduced a Ruby-based way for you to create apps, and then they have this, this set of compilers that will ge generate either Android or iPhone or uh, BlackBerry or what, Windows Phone 7, whatever the platform that, uh, that you want. The, uh, now, I think Romobile is acquired by Motorola. So uh, you still get the, the open source uh, SDK, but uh, the, the, the set of tools is now owned by Motorola and they are doing more of an enterprise uh, sort of application set with that. Then there are other, other players. So there's one called PhoneGap. There's this one called Mobile. 
which is actually a, a project from a graduate student in uh, Netherlands. So all these uh, tools generate applications based on abstractions, different levels of abstractions. So in, in case of uh, Romobile, the abstractions are based on the Ruby language, so they are more like Ruby functions. So in case of, oh, sorry, in case of PhoneGap, the, it's basically JavaScript. It's HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Uh, and in case of mobile, it's a special language that the mobile people uh, introduce. Then there are application generators for the for web, meaning, uh, so if you've seen this one, this is Google Web Toolkit. Google Web Toolkit is a Java-based app generator that generates these web apps. So you can write Java code, it generates a HTML, JavaScript-based front-end, plus this a serverlet-based backend. And similarly, Code on Time is a Azure uh, win, uh, .NET based app, app generator and they basically generate web apps. Given these, let's see where, where they stand in terms of complexity and platform independence. Of course, when you, if you use direct programming, which is you know, tightly coupled to the platform, you see that it's somewhat complex and it's very much tied to the, the platform. The general programming language based frameworks, the ones we saw like uh, you know, Code on Time or JWT, they are somewhat complex, they are definitely less complex than doing it uh, you know, in the raw form, but still there's, uh, there's, uh, there's some complexity, but fair bit of platform independence. What's desired really is some, something in this area, which is basically less complexity and more platform independence, as, it's got, uh, as, as it seems right now. Similarly, when you go for cloud interactions, the, the first thing that you see in the market right now is these things called cloud brokers. Now, if you, uh, if you, if you read the literature, you'll see that one of the earliest players in this uh, space is RightScale. The moment that the Amazon and Rackspace came into being, RightScale is the first one that came up with a product that allowed people to have a single console or a single dashboard to control both of them. So <clears throat> the idea of a cloud broker is that basically the, the, most of them are very much focused on the infrastructure clouds. They give you a single point of control, a single set of uh, interfaces to control all of those uh, uh, you know, infrastructure resources. Similarly, there's the open source solution. But you can move applications from one place to another place. Um, if if the application has everything that it that it needs, so so so, um, you may be able to move some things, but not all of them. Depend depending on the application, because uh, one thing is that like like if you think of Rackspace versus Amazon, so Amazon has these storage solutions, the queuing solutions. Many, many application developers use those services. The moment you use them, then uh, there's no way you can go to Rackspace because Rackspace has none of them. Or, or they have, but in a different flavor. So the open source solution for this you know, cloud, uh, uh, multi-cloud uh, uh, interaction is API libraries. So one of the two uh, most uh, prominent ones are LibCloud and Delta Cloud. They're both for, uh, free and completely open, and they're both from Apache Software Foundation. Just uh, uh, th that's sort of the irony in open source that they are doing the same thing, absolutely the same thing. But Delta Cloud is based on Ruby, LibCloud is based on Python. Um, similarly, J Clouds is another set of such APIs, but as the J implies, it's Java. So this is the open source solution. Now, if you look at, again, our, our uh, family of complexity versus independence diagram, you see that the moment you use original cloud APIs, then you are tightly locked in, and it, they're somewhat complex. If you work with the Amazon APIs, then they're, they're not easy to figure out. So, so what do these APIs uh, provide? Um, so if uh, the so like, they were configuring and uh, yeah, those kind of things? Yeah. So non-functional uh, issues? 
um, functional and non-functional. So you can sometimes... Um, Does it provide data types and those kind of things? No, no, not really. No. They're, they're basically, you, you can say they're all primarily system-based configurations. Functional, Most of them. Functional yeah. in the sense queuing, for example, or something like that, right? Um, no, I just want to make a distinction between writing application specific logic but right. that can be retargeted to different platforms mm -hmm. versus basically fixing the configuration of the machine resources. That yeah, so th these ones are basically about uh, the configuration. So so if you look at the libcloud API, they have uh, methods for like allocate VM. So, so allocate VM has different names, th that same operation has different names, say Rackspace versus Amazon. So they basically made it one operation. All you would say is allocate VM Amazon. So it knows internally how what call to actually work and what parameters to pass and all. Um, so here you see that when you use the Oracle Cloud APIs, you are still tied to the platform, somewhat complex. If you go for the API-based solutions like uh, LibCloud or uh, Delta Cloud, you see that there's a a uh, fair bit of platform independence, but still the, 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 you have to master them. Uh, you, you have to learn them. So there's a fair bit of complexity involved. Cloud brokers, on the other hand, gives you much less complexity, but uh, again with some fair bit of uh, platform independence. So they're somewhat closer to the, uh, the area that we want to go in. So this is the type of solution area we are interested in again. That is less complexity, more platform independence. Okay, what are we going to do? In in two slides, we are going to apply something called a domain-specific language into this sense. So so we are going to program using DSLs. DSLs are going to be our key in uh, providing platform independence in programming. Then in during interaction, we are going to use middleware, basically to deploy and manage applications, we are going to use middleware as our uh, basic premise. Keeping that in mind, now let's go into the details. First, abstractions for program generation. Now, before we go into pretty much the details of this one, let's do a little primer, a background on languages in one slide. What makes up a language? There are three things that make up a language. One, there's a abstract syntax model. You can think of this as a, a mathematical or a semantic model of your, of your, uh, of your language. And then there's, the con there's a, then there's a concrete syntax. The concrete syntax is what you actually see. So what you write as a program is in this concrete syntax. And, and of course, there are transformations that mm, uh, transform the ASM from a CSM and vice versa. And, and as it uh, appears, you can have one ASM and multiple CSM. So you can have this, the same model represented in multiple languages. Here's a quick view of how that happens. So you have the abstract model, you have the concrete model, and there are transformations that you can you know, use to go in between them. What is a domain-specific language? That's, the, the, that's one of our key uh, uh, premises. So here's the, the most, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say verbose, but the most uh, applicable definition. I don't want to read out this definition. I've just highlighted a few things that are important. One. Appropriate notations and abstractions. Next, restricted to a problem domain. So, in, in, in very simple terms, a DSL is a programming language that is focused on a domain. You can, you can call it a specification language also. You, it, it, might, it might not represent a program as you think of it. It, it, it may only make sense to a domain expert or, or to a person who, who knows the domain. What is a domain? 
So, so I was doing this, uh, doing a mock presentation to a, uh, to a set of students yesterday, and this was the first question that came up: What is a, what is a domain? So, we'll we'll keep this as the definition of the domain: a set of operations and activities that we are interested in. So, if you if you think of logic, there's a different, you know, more rigorous. Uh, definition of a domain, but for us, we are we are concerned of you know a set of activities focused on uh, some some uh, uh, problem. So let's call that domain. A model. We we'll need this definition soon enough. A model is an abstraction. So we, you you may have heard this whole thing about modeling and you know software design and uh, UML. So what all they all of them are trying to do is to provide an abstraction of a system or, or an environment or or, uh, uh, or you, in in our case say a domain. Now, having all this, let's figure out what's the link between domain models and DSLs. Of course, there's a very close link. We know that uh, there is a sort of hierarchy in this before we actually go into the the link. The hierarchy is that there's something called a meta model. You you may not have come across this uh, a lot. This is uh, mostly discussed in the circles of you know these domain specific modeling crowd. So you have a model that represents the domain, and you have something called a meta model that describes this model. So think of it. If you know, uh, hope, hopefully you you all know what XML is. Think of it as the XML file and its schema. So you have a you have some data in an XML, and out there there's a schema that says these are the permissible elements that comes in for this XML. So the relationship between model and the the relationship between model and meta model is similar to between the schema and its instance. Okay, what is the, the relationship we are interested in? in? In our case, the ASM, that is the abstract syntax model of the DSL, is really the domain's meta model. So basically what we are saying is that the moment you have a domain meta model, you have the abstract model that represents your language. Okay. Having said that, let's go on. How do we use now? Now let's go back to our context of cloud applications. How do we use these DSLs in in cloud applications? Well, how do we link them? So now we have we come to this in, interesting junction. What is what is a cloud application? What is it made of? So that is the first thing that we discussed in this you know research. So uh, in a, a two-part article in uh, IEEE Computing, we discussed what consists, what, what, what does a cloud, cloud application consist of. Basically, we identified four different aspects. One, there are data aspects. In this. So there, you have to represent and you have to express data and data-related operations in some way. Then you have functional aspects. We call it logic and process uh, aspects. So you have to, you know, have your logic encoded in some way. Then there are non-functional aspects. Non-functional aspects you can think of as quality of service issues. So it doesn't have to do anything with how you actually encode your logic, but when you maybe when you expose it to the outside world, then you have to think of the, the quality of service aspects. Then there are system aspects. The system aspects define how, what is the uh, the configuration of this app, how is it, uh, you know, put in in the cloud, things like that. These four aspects make up a cloud application. Now we know. So what we are trying to do is to apply or introduce DSLs into the into these aspects. So it could be one DSL that covers, say, more than one, one aspect, or it could be a collection of DSLs each DSL covering a, a singular aspect. Now, 
let's let's go to a, a, a let's think of how do we formulate this as a theoretical uh, problem or what is the theoretical perspective of this one in in order to make a theoretical per, theoretical uh, perspective let's focus on the transformation now what we are really trying to do is to transform a domain models a model that is understood by only the domain experts to a model that you can uh, create an app on a cloud so basically what we are trying to do is to uh, focus on transformations that goes from the model to the cloud now given this we are going to focus on the properties of these transformations and uh, asserting that each model is a graph so here's a here's a quick uh, overview of how, how these transformations work. Assume that this is the domain model and this is the, the model uh, of your computation or model of your domain in a cloud implementable way. Now, the, the transformation is defined by looking at the meta models, but it's applied on the model instances. So in order to understand this, Think of our early example of XML. Hopefully, you all heard of what's XSL, X, X, uh, XSLD, the uh, Extensible Style Sheet Transformations. Now, XSLD works on XML files. So, you have to pass a XML instance, and the XSL uh, will con convert that into another XML instance. But when you define this transformation, what you have to look at is the schema. Looking at the XML will give you some idea, but not the complete picture. So in order for you to write a accurate transformation, you have to look at the schemas. So it's exactly what's happening here. You have to look at the meta models in, or, in order for you to define the transformation. And that transformation is executed only on the models, not on the meta models. So that is the idea here. This is just the same 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 diagram, but we've introduced uh, uh, these uh, notations. Now, the first one, what we what we found was that you have to define each and every distinct concept distinctly in the domain meta. Now, this this may seem like unnecessary. Now, he, here's Here's actually the you know sort of like the mathematical proof. I don't want to go through this. This is this is simply saying I can translate it to you in simple terms. So basically, what it's saying is that if you assume that there's a, a semantically different two two concepts are represented by one, then uh, uh, there's no way that you can actually write a transformation that will translate that into two different operations in the the cloud cloud you know model now here's the here's a here's a very quick example this is a typical meta model for mathematical expressions now this was actually taken from a, the book sort of like the bible on this uh, domain specific languages and meta models this is the typical meta model that you get because in this case you see that there's only one operator in a typical math expression when you when you want to uh, pass it or uh, the, the typical use of meta models or abstract syntax models in the in our case uses this kind of meta model. but what we are saying is what is required is a little more so you have to define these distinct operators distinctly in your meta model so that that is the the premise of our condition and, and similarly, the, the next condition is about the transformation. It's basically saying, okay, you, your transformation should yield a complete target model. What, uh, what it means is that in, in a different mathematical sense, the mapping that you are uh, uh, defining, the, the, uh, you can think of it as a function that maps a set of nodes to a, you know, another set of nodes. That mapping has to be an on-to mapping, meaning it, it must completely define the target model 
it may not use everything that's on the source model, but it should yield a completed target model. Now, <clears throat> again, the, the, the rationale, or uh, we don't want to call it a proof, but it's, uh, the rationale is that if, when you have a node, that is, uh, if, if you miss something in the cloud model, if you don't define something, then ultimately you can't actually translate that to a concrete syntax on the other end. So would this be sort of like when you compare you know, Google App Engine and Amazon and there are features that are not present, your metamodel cannot include those features? Um, uh, 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 sort of. So, so basically what it's saying is that if, if you have a domain model and then you are a domain meta model and you're trying to define a transformation, let's say, let's say that there's the, you, your domain meta model does not have something that is directly relevant to what Google App Engine is asking, right? What this says is that you can't just ignore that. So basically your transformation should assume and should make sure that the model on the other end is complete. And then, uh, so, so basically this introduces assumptions into the, the transformation. So ultimately what this means is that the, the, the next lemma is what is uh, probably important, that is your transmission is not reversible. So, so in, in slightly in terms of uh, mathematics, you know, pure mathematics, you, there will be one case that you can actually do that. There's something called bijection, that is, uh, you know, one-to-one -one mapping in terms of functions. So uh, the surjective onto mapping is a, uh, superset that includes bijectivity, one case. So, but, but ultimately in practice, you, you will not come across in a, in, a, in a case where you can actually map one to one, very rare. So, so for all practical purposes, you can think of it as not the transformation not being able to be reversed. Now, there, there, there is a, a derived condition that is that you, when, you, when you come to map reduce models, so it simply means this the second condition simply implies that if you are trying to do a map reduce computation or if you are trying to map your domain into a map reduce uh, model then you should be able to map each and every concept or you should be able to you know completely define a, uh, a map reduce model using your domain meta model now this 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 all looks you know nice or, or, or pretty mathematical but what, what, what is there in, uh, in practice for it? Basically what it means is you have to put a lot of effort or more effort than usual to create these domain uh, meta models. So that, that implies something about the effort that you require. On the other hand, it implies that unless you, you get, a ch get the ability to transform your models into Say, say map reduce, so all models may not be able to, uh, you, you may not be able to do, you know, a map reduce uh, style. Or, in, in, in most importantly, it, you may not be able to reverse engineer things. So, so in practice, really, there, there may be a possibility of doing that. If you look at, uh, you know, model transformation, that literature, there, there is some work in, uh, adding annotations to your generated target model. So, so the, the uh, transformation actually adds these hints on the, the uh, target model, or the generated model, that gives it uh, gives a reverse engineering app hints on saying what kind of assumptions were made so that they can be reversed. So you, sh you would not be able to you know, reverse engineer things once you go from so it the domain to the other. Once you deploy the app and there's a problem, debugging at that level means that if you make a change here, it doesn't reflect. And yeah, that's, that's true. If you, if you make a change to your, your, your app, then, then you might not be able to come back. That's basically what it means. So, so let's say you make a change in, in your generated app. So let's, let me jump ahead and uh, get an example from one of the practical ones. So let's say you, you wrote things in a, in a DSL and it translated down into a Hadoop program. And, and you figured that, okay, there's, I have an issue with this Hadoop program, I need to change something. You change some parameters, but because you, you, it's not clear how this transformation, what kind of assumptions were made, 
you may not be able to map it back unless you know the internals of the transformations very, very uh, you know, uh, deeply. You may not be able to map it back down to the, the you abstracted form. So, so that's the implication of doing this, and and it's, it it gives gives rise to this uh, paradigm we are following. That is our uh, system or our method is based on top down. Uh, that is, we have you have you have to start up front with the uh, abstract design and then go down. You can't go bottom up, and you know you can't put things together and, and uh, build one. Uh, you have to think of in abstract terms first, and then go down. Okay. Um, so so in 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 my in the start, I talked about data. Uh, now we we saw that there's a data aspect to it. So the schema of the data will be part of, will be represented as a DSL. Now, the, the interesting thing here is that you saw that interoperability is, is a con consideration. Now, part of this interoperability comes into play when, it, when, you, when you think of data. So, so data interoperability has been talked about for a long time and it's, you know, cloud is just one of the, the platform systems that's facing it. But the, the point here, um, what I'm trying to make, is that because we have these abstractions or, or uh, abstracted schemas for data, we can use something like ontologies. Now, the moment you say ontologies, some practitioners say, oh, that's too complex for us. So that, that's probably one of the issues that you have, unless you are in a you know, more restricted domain, uh, some, some people don't, uh, they, they basically look the other way when you say ontology. But um, the, the case with this approach, the approach we have is that because we are using abstractions, high level abstractions, using DSLs, you can easily incorporate ontologies into this mix. Um, I'll give you an example when, when we go to the practical apps of how we do that. So we are supplementing data interoperability as well, not, in, not only in terms of schema, maybe in terms of uh, you know, uh, ontology-based transformations and, and migration as well. Okay, let's move on to practical applications. Now, uh, I'm going to present two applications. I'm going to uh, dive deep, uh, slightly deeper into MobiCloud and then I'm going to just rush through the other one. Um, so MobiCloud is... Uh, Basically, a, a, a uh, application that uh, I worked on with uh, uh, Ashwin Manjunatha, who was a master's student, and uh, he he took the concept uh, that uh, uh, I proposed, and we sort of uh, went on building this tool, and then later uh, uh, Max and uh, all these uh, other collaborators came came into the picture also. Now, <coughs> MobiCloud is a cloud mobile hybrid application generator. What is a cloud mobile hybrid? It's a app that has a front end on a mobile device and a back end on a cloud. So, so simply, we call both these pieces the app. Now, you can't just use the, the back end, you can't just use the front end. So you have to have both pieces for you to function. Here's, here's a quick you know, glance at it. So you, are, you have a piece running in uh, the Amazon or Google. You have a piece running on your mobile. This is slightly older phone, but it's, it's really the phone that I've tested, so that's one reason that I've put it here. Um, so you see that there's a piece that, that actually goes to the device. There's a piece that goes to the, the cloud. The data storage actually happens on the cloud, and the cloud app provides this uh, service interface. Now, <coughs> Mobi Cloud is a app generator that generates both these pieces. And you did this one? Okay. The first, the first um, we, we had the concept, I think, at the end of 2009. And uh, we had a tool uh, by the end of 2010. But that tool was very, very basic. And uh, uh, it, it, uh, so the one we demonstrated in Cloudcom in 2010 November, was a text-based composer plus the you know app uh, generation, piece. and then uh, by mid 2011, I had all the, the visual composers, the the catalog, 
the reason I ask is because extensions now with iOS five, that's uh -huh. what they do exactly. So I see. Right. So okay. Right. But it came out previous. Right. All right. So so we 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 had the idea and we we uh, wrote it. Uh, iOS five won't be multi platform. That's right. But it does the the back end and the front end. Yeah. I see. Of okay. Yeah. 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 I, I cloud integration. Yes. So, so we, we, DSL, we had that coming for a, <laughs> for a while. For us, DSL, the interoperability is a very important aspect. Right, right. right. Um, so, so Mobi Cloud is simply architected as follows. So th there is a bunch of templates that generate code. And the, these templates work off a, a <coughs> uh, abstraction-based templating engine. So basically what it does is that it takes in the DSL, the DSL may be created in a number of ways you can use a graphical composer, you can use a text based composer. Once the DSL is fed into the templating engine, you can select what template or, or uh, you know multiple templates if you want to and, and uh, go for a f uh, mobile platform plus a cloud platform. So you can easily add a number of other templates if you want to. So it's, it's a well defined API uh, for the templating engine for you to add new platform. Now, the DSL itself, so here's a DSL script that shows you the, the how a script looks like. Now, this is, this is not very uh, readable, I would suppose, uh, but, but what is uh, important for you to note is that this is all there to it. So, this language is something that you can learn in one afternoon because there are no loops or no while, do whiles, no, uh, uh, you know, if elses, things like that for you to learn. There's, there's no uh, really hard paradigm for you to learn, like, uh, say, say, object orientation, or, you know, so I, I know some undergrads sometimes uh, uh, work hard on understanding polymorphism, things like that. So there are no such big concepts that you have to, you know, learn. Even though this looks cryptic right now, it's basically just three three components: models, views, and controllers. If you programmed at uh, some point on web applications, then MVC, model view controller, is the first paradigm that you learn. So if you know web programming, then this is a piece of cake to you. If you don't want to see this kind of text, then of course there's a solution. We have our nice graphical composer. So you don't even have to know how to, how to you know put a model in, in code. You just drag the I model icon and add the attributes to it, all visual, all graphically. So you can use the the, the graphical composer also. Then we th this composer is public, so you can you know if if you want you can use it right now. Then we have uh, a catalog. The catalog is basically you can think of it as a code repository. What's uh, interesting about this catalog is that it's tightly coupled to the uh, composer, so you can directly import and export from the composer. So, so within the composer, you can just search, okay, show me all the apps that people have done for this particular thing. And then you just one click of a button, it drags on the code and regenerates the visual representation of it. Um, this is also available publicly. and. Now, as I was saying, Mobi Cloud has extensions that enable the use of known ontology. So one of the one of the famous uh, extensions we have is Fof. So as you saw in this one, uh, this script. So I'm saying model name name is task, and then I go on describing what this model has, right? So for for when you enable this extension, you can just say I have a fourth person, so you just give the name model fourth person, and as long as when the when the extension is active, so you have to activate it by adding a little uh, extra line of code on top. When the extension is active, it picks it up from the ontology and it looks at the, the attributes and you know uh, uh, adds the attributes automatically. So it gives you a way of incorporating this known standard data types into your program very very easily. Here's a quick scenario in a nutshell. This is something that I actually encountered, a, a real scenario. So I was told by the health center maybe two months ago that I should monitor my blood pressure for a week. 
I don't have a blood pressure monitor at home. I go to the nearest supermarket which has the free one. But I don't want to take a pen and paper every time I go there. I want a little app on my phone for me to record these values and, and, and keep tabs on it. So how do I do that? I don't want to, basically, I, I know Android. I, I know how to create Android apps. But I don't want to sit in front of my computer for, for half a day, you know, figuring this out. And I, I want my data to be in the cloud. So my job is much harder. This is an ideal case for Mobi Cloud. So it has data values, so it's data driven. Just four data values to be uh, stored and retrieved. It, it, it requires only a simple user interface. And the data source or the, or the data storage is uh, your, your personal space. So let's say Google App Engine. It's a personal Google App Engine account that you'll probably be using. You take to the mobile cloud composer, drag and drop these. Uh, um, okay, let this be. Give me one second. Okay, you just minimize. It. Yeah, I'll just minimize. It. It's probably a network glitch. Okay. okay. Um, so you basically have a. Uh, model that represents these blood, pre blood pressure figures. So if you look look here, you see that there are uh, you know, diastolic, systolic, and date, with, which you recorded, and plus the machine gives you something called the pulse rate. So, so there are these three values plus the date. And there are two views, one to add, one to show. So this takes you like two, three minutes for, for, uh, for you to compose in a visual composer. And uh, once you, uh, oh, I know. This is, it's an answer. Yeah, it's, I did that. So this generates an app like this. So this is how it looks like on the mobile phone. So you basically get two waves. Remember, you didn't define this. This was automatically figured out by the composer. Or the, or the code generator. And it generated you two waves. One wave that, that lets you add these things. So if, if since you said date, it added a little date picker automatically, right? And you have these uh, uh, text boxes that you can add them. And then this is the, the show wave. It gives you a list of things based uh, and, and uh, what you have added a, in, a, as a list. Even for an Android guru, this will take a few hours to do. If you want to connect it to a cloud backend, it will take a few more hours. This one, we did this and deployed it. There's a inbuilt deployment and compilation support. All these things happen under five minutes. So that's the sort of advantage that you get by applying a DSL or, or you know suitable abstractions into this uh, picture. Um, you also have a view of the of, in the cloud, right? I can go yes, to yes. The cloud. So, so, so um, I don't have a screenshot, yeah, but yeah. Uh, so, so there is a human viewable view on the cloud side. Of course, there's a service interface that, as 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 you saw on that big picture, <coughs> but there's a human view that you can view the data on the on your browser as well. I haven't shown this in in this one, but it definitely creates a little uh, you know JSP based front end for you to debug and see whether everything's there. Now, Mobi Cloud won the technology award at the Fukuoka Ruby Innovators Competition. This is a, a significant award because there was 82 competitors from nine countries and only two technology awards were given. Altogether, it was like 10 awards. So, so it's a, a, a pretty big deal and the the biggest uh, thing with Mobi Cloud was that they saw that this is something really cool, something that is going to uh, help people get things done. So that was the idea of uh, that was the their statement saying, you know, this is going to move, uh, this is going to give uh, uh, better uh, accessibility to a lot of people. 
the second one, now this is where we are actually going to help our biology professor, who will uh, say Dr. A, right? He, he's the one who wanted to use multiple uh, uh, clouds and, and not be locked into one. Scale is again, uh, the, the concept and implementation came from me. Uh, 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 Dr. Paul Anderson is one of the, the people who helped me in you know, conceptualizing, conceptualizing this idea. Um, so scale is very, very similar to Mobi Cloud, but on a completely different uh, target market or, or, or a target segment. Basically, the DSL looks like this. Now you see that DSL is quite different. It's, it looks basically like a you know a little sequence of things. So you you uh, do a, you make a function call like uh, operation, and then uh, there, there are variables and things like that. But it's it's pretty different from what we saw earlier. The idea of this one is this is a simple uh, statistical workflow. But the, the issue with this one is that you have to run this on a huge data set. So basically, what scale does is, given th this kind of a DSL, it generates Hadoop programs. So one of the targets that it supports is Hadoop. It generates this uh, whole big chunk of Java code that uh, you can just uh, run on a Hadoop cluster, crunching these numbers. It can, gener it can generate a Azure implementation. So Windows Azure is Microsoft's cloud based on .NET. It did not have anything related to uh, MapReduce or any, anything that uh, that resembles MapReduce. But maybe about six months ago, or, or maybe a year ago, I suppose, Microsoft Research came up with something called the Daytona framework. That's a .NET-based MapReduce framework. It's it. It's not really Hadoop. It's some, there are some concepts that are slightly different, but it l looks a lot like Hadoop. Now, <clears throat> apart from these parallel high-performance uh, implementations, this one can also generate a little Ruby program that actually lets you do that in your desktop. So you, you can, as a biologist, if, if, if you are a biologist interested in this one, you can get a small data set, run it on your personal computer using the Ruby program to see if it gives you the desired results, and then get the Hadoop version and get all your experimental results, put it in the, the cluster or Amazon or, uh, or whatever the, the cloud and get them uh, done. So. Scale, if you look at this, this is eerily similar to what we saw in MobiCloud, so it's exactly the same thing, except for the actual parser used here, the templating engine was reused. I just rewrote most of the templates uh, and, and, and uh, used a different parser, but still, everything else remains the same. Now, the tools we have, you see that the composer we have is almost exactly what MobiCloud is, except these bits and these bits. So uh, again, uh, for the composer, most of the pieces were reused as well, but the 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 uh, target was completely different. Does it also set up the the Hadoop cluster? Um, no, not as at the moment. Uh, so so it basically creates you a piece of Java code and an ant build file. So so it assumes a little bit of things that uh, the user would know, but but on on the other hand. Uh, we can easily integrate that uh, functionality into it. Now, <clears throat> this is also available publicly, so if you want to play around, yes, you can. Um, so, so this is this is what what's the the end goal. So, our friendly biologist now gets the gets to compose his programs on Visual Composer without actually installing any new tools on his computer. Right? It's done completely on the browser, and uh, then he all he does is okay. Let's go for Azure because we have Azure access for now. And then tomorrow, Microsoft goes away. You uh, go for Amazon or your local cluster or whatever the option that is available to you. What did we learn from these projects? So <clears throat> let me give you a quick uh, view of the code metrics. So we looked at the lines of code generated for, uh, with the, uh, by the applications. 
this some some say this lines of code may not be a really accurate representation of the code's complexity that is true in a sense but doing a full complexity analysis is hard meaning it takes time on the other hand it it may not reflect the true complexity also so in lines of code is really really easy to compare and and calculate and and it's a fairly good metric for you to look at in terms of uh, complexity so here's here's a quick view of mobi cloud generated apps so you see that these are like base we call them <coughs> base mobi cloud there's a second generation of mobi cloud that allows you to have uh, extensions so you could uh, incorporate specific functionality that was not in the original one um, you see that the dsl script remained roughly at 10 lines of code but sometimes the code generated on uh, say android exceeded 1000 lines so it's, it's a sizable uh, chunk of code that you have to write now I, uh, remember that this is a logarithmic scale so if, when you go from one notch to the other it's 10 times more code now uh, this may not reflect some things one is that let's say android when you do an android project you not only have to write code in this in the sense that they want but you have to also organize your code in a really specific way so android apps have very specific folder structures this is something that's taken care of by the generator that is not reflected here and then uh, 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 that same argument applies to Google App Engine, which has a very specific structure uh, that uh, uh, that you have to have of the app. And and if if you are the type that will you know uh, uh, would go into the code and change it, then you can still use this one to generate this boilerplate code. The generators generate a, a and build file, so. If you want to modify your code, building is also pretty easy. So if it, it gives you the facility for you to you know, use it as a boilerplate code generator if you are not interested in just taking the plain one. Now, here's the one with scale. You see that scale is, so the, the Hadoop ones are primarily, uh, you know, again, the, this one's much smaller lines of code, but the Hadoop code that gets generated is pretty, uh, pretty large, right? Uh, um, and the, the Ruby code is not that large, but it's still a, a, a little bit more complex than just writing the, the DSL. Now, what does this mean? This means that there's a significant effort saved in, in, in writing this program. And, and in, in the domain itself, right? Automatic generated code can be always very much larger than what human might call, right? Um, Yes, but uh, how how this uh, how this was done was that I actually, as a human, wrote this program first without thinking of the the the, uh, the DSL, and then I picked up chunks of code that are static, not that does not depend on uh, the, what uh, what the, the operation is, and the pieces that are specific. So so it, the code is somewhat optimized. You can say say in that sense, and I I wouldn't say it's completely you know uh, the it, it it it's it's completely optimized, but still it's much more optimized than you know doing a pure you know code gen uh, <laughs> blind insertion of pieces of code and stuff. So um, there is you know, a, a significant uh, improvement in this one. Now, what is the effort? Is, is this, if, if you, of course you can, if, if you can save effort, that's fine, but if you have to make more effort to save that, then that, that sort of negates the, the uh, good. Now, this is the, the lines of code that's in the templates. So the template, is roughly at about 1,200 lines. That's the biggest one. Now, the, the difference that you see with red and blue is basically 
resources are the static pieces of code. Blue ones are the dynamic pieces of code. So the, the static pieces, there are uh, some with GAE, some with EC2, not a lot with uh, Android. But uh, the, the idea is that this is a manageable effort. This is not that complex. This is not a huge effort for you to do. Because if you look at the apps that were generated, the Android app itself is about 1,200 lines of code. And, and the, the templates have roughly the same size. But you will be reusing these templates many times, right? And, and this is similar in the case of scale. So it's again roughly the same size, but you see there's a, a lot of static code that gets inserted into this uh, 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 code, uh, generated code. So there's a lot more static code involved in, in this one uh, with scale, but uh, not, not a lot uh, dynamic code. But still, there's uh, not a lot of effort in, in doing it. So the effort in doing this is pretty manageable. Here's, here's where our solution stands, as I, as I see it. So if you remember this complexity and uh, platform independence one. So our solution lies in the desired region. What is not reflected here is that there is a catch. The catch is how flexible is your solution. That uh, axis is not represented here. If you think of it, the DSL, the more abstract representation that you provide, the less flexible that you, you get. So the, um, if, if you go down to direct programming on the platform, there's a lot of changes, a lot of uh, differences that you can make. But it's not so when you go up to the DSL. This trade-off, I think, is valid when you consider a, a, a domain-driven perspective. That is, uh, let's let, if you take the view of, say, Dr. A, right? He is a biologist. He, he's, his aim is crunching his numbers. So if, if he gets the ability to crunch his numbers, he doesn't care whether he is um, utilizing every bit of feature that is available to him in a given cloud. He is, uh, in, in, another, in, in another way, uh, he is application oriented. So as long as his application runs, everything else is somewhat, uh, 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 I would say, uh, he can ignore everything, uh, most of the other things. Right? Yeah, I have a question. So, yeah. so the complexity got pushed into the templates. Yes, right? sort of. Yes. So, so when you write the template, you do need to sit with a domain expert? Um, so how I did it was, uh, I sat with a domain expert and I, I didn't show him the abstraction. I, 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 showed, I, 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 I wrote a complete right working program. So he gave me the, these requirements, okay, saying, okay, first we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. And then I implemented them uh, in, in one program. And then I'm the one who figured out that, okay, if you abstract this piece, then this is the one that, uh, that you have to insert there. This is how, how you organize it. So you, yes, you have to sit with an, a, a domain expert, but I think what, as with any you know, DSL or, or model-driven uh, uh, solution, this uh, has the ben benefit in the long run. So uh, you, you may have to have some effort. The effort comparable to writing one application when you create the templates, but then uh, that gets reused in you know, more than one way, and then that, that's where the, the, the advantage seeps in. So, okay, uh, we are about one hour. I'm going to take 10 more minutes to, to run through this. And, and of course, uh, Max is here to talk about uh, some of this so, uh, later in his talk. So you'll probably hear a lot of uh, details on what I'm going to say. Anyway. Abstractions for cloud interactions. So I said earlier that we are going to use middleware. What is middleware? Of course, you, uh, the, the word where might give you a hint that it's a type of software. It is a type of software. And it's uh, usually used to give a unified API to applications, given that you have some 
different or heterogeneous APIs that you have to abstract out. So this happens in many different ways. So there are middleware that, uh, pieces that abstract certain OS features. There are middleware that's, that abstract certain uh, service level features. So there are different types of middleware. The, but the, the general concept remains the same. The idea of middleware is to sit in between and provide uh, abstractions or uh, really process abstractions. Now, in the cloud context, what can we abstract out? As, as, as I was saying, cloud application deployment is one of these processes. Application undeployment is one of these processes. And, and the other one we looked at is data snapshot. So basically, uh, in our practical setting, we looked at these three operations primarily. Um, there is the additional benefit. You will uh, get a better picture when you when, when I go into the details of our practical uh, application, the additional benefit is that you get to enforce patterns. We call them best practices. Now, the, here, here's an example. Let's say you figured out that uh, <coughs> when you put a web application in Amazon Cloud, this um, can be the best way to do that, or the most feasible way to do that is to have a, a horizontally replicate, replicating configuration. Now, you as, a, as an expert would know that, but a newcomer would not realize that. How do you, how do you make the newcomer use this well-known pattern? So if you are using this middleware, then it's very, very easy for you to enforce or give a hint on using this. And, and uh, then uh, they, uh, uh, they get reused more often and uh, it, it, it's a better use of resources. So, in, in telling you how to apply middleware in a cloud context, here's a general architecture. This looks a lot like uh, what we saw in Mobi Cloud at scale, but now these are cloud interfaces, right? So you have adapters that you can, you know, uh, push in. I'm going to go to the practical application and show you in practice how this works. So the practical application is Alphacumulus, which is uh, uh, conceptualized by Max, and we evolved the context, this concept in 2009 during my internship. So I was one of the four-person team that actually built this, and uh, uh, basically it's, as we said, a cloud middleware system, and it supported three platforms. You could uh, do things with Amazon EC2, you could do, do things with Google App Engine, and there was uh, the third option being IBM, IBM has its uh, uh, infrastructure cloud solution called HiPods. It's, uh, it's not public, I don't think it's public. It's basically the type of private cloud that IBM installs. So let's say you call IBM today and say, I want a private cloud in my house, and they'll bring in a HiPod system and put it up for you. It's That's one of the precursor to the current public cloud. Oh, I see, okay. So, then we, we introduced a, uh, several concepts. We introduced the, the concept of config bundles, uh, uh, credential bundles, and then I think the best concept that we came up with is this idea of best practices or reusable patterns. Now, here's, here's how AltraCumulus look like. So it's exactly like what you saw. There's a, a slight difference here that AltraCumulus was completely based on a service interface. So even the dashboard, the, the user app, was a separate app that interacted with the code through a service interface. And we could plug in things, so you could plug in any other different adapter, it had a nice uh, well-defined API that looked like in 2009. Um, basically, you this is a view of the deployment. What you see here is that these two will seem identical, but this one, this is an app that's running in Google, this is an app that's running in Hyper. So as a user, you don't see a lot of difference. You, basically, what is different here is that you, you selected a, a different best practice, and you selected different config bundles. So these config bundles are predefined configurations or, or predefined sets of parameters that you can just say, add to my application. And, and of course, depending on where you go, you have to uh, find, uh, select a different you know, uh, credential. Here's where Altocumulus stands. Of course, it's, uh, it, it has 
the, the same uh, fate in terms of flexibility. Of course, it's in the desired range when you think of platform independence and complexity, but it sort of sacrificed some of the, the flexibility that you have when you actually go uh, to use these original cloud APIs. Um, I'm very happy to say that Alcumulus uh, had a life after its uh, research career. <laughs> So it basically became a major part of the IBM's cloud offering, IBM Pure Systems. And uh, I think it's, uh, it comes to the commercial world as IBM Workload Deployer. The Workload Deployer is a sub-tool in this whole you know, Pure Systems uh, cloud offering. So, so it, it's a, a success, Max will tell you hopefully in his talk, that when you go from research to product, it's it's not a very uh, uh, common occurrence. So there's a lot of research things, and there's a lot of improvements, but the, the business value uh, of these research projects is not realized all the time. So there are some projects that actually make into products of, that comes from research. There are a lot more that don't make into products. Of course, they're out there, you know, they're public tools, and they're you know, exposed to the public in some way, but they don't actually make into a product for various reasons. So this is one of those success stories, as I see, uh, that went from research to, to actual product. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have a check, but... <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> so um, here's a quick view of the publication coverage. So we, we've had uh, several publications, uh, two actually, in uh, Uppsala in 2009 on Anticumulus, and we also made a demonstration of the tool at that time. And uh, then Morbi Cloud. Uh, the major papers of MobiCloud was in CloudCom 2010, uh, which was uh, in Indianapolis. And then uh, the, the new version of MobiCloud, which uh, has these uh, extensions and uh, new functionality, was presented in Splash, the DSM workshop. Um, scale, the, the basic concept of scale was uh, uh, introduced in BICOG in 2011. And, and the, the, the cloud modeling and uh, you know, the uh, aspect uh, breakdown was presented in IEEE Internet Computing. There's a paper under review which, is, which includes all these uh, you know, model, uh, modeling constraints, the transformation constraints that I presented to you. That's still under review with uh, IEEE uh, uh, transactions in uh, services computing, TSE. Um, so we, we've had a lot of success in, in, in publications in terms of this, these uh, projects. So here's a you know, complete list of these publications. So you, uh, the, the, you know, the citation style. Um, what is the conclusion? So we saw that the, the DSLs provide abstractions in terms of uh, the domain context that is feasible for us to use to develop cloud applications, and of course, in, in a platform agnostic way. But what is important to note here is in the context of the domain. So, so uh, as I was saying about flexibility, the moment you go out of the domain, the moment you lose your domain, if, if, if you don't want your domain perspective, then things might not seem that useful. But within a domain, for a, if you think in, in terms of the biologists that we were talking about, that is a huge improvement to him, having the ability to not have a big bulky tool in his computer, just go to the, the browser, drag and drop things, and push a few buttons to get his computation running. And, and similarly, the middleware-based process are an, uh, a feasible way of deploying and managing apps, and, and uh, something that I didn't mention, we had AltoCumulus running in uh, what we call the IBM technology Adaption program, TAP. It's called TAP. It's basically you can think of it as a internal repository of software that people can try out within IBM. So we had Altocumulus running on the TAP, and uh, there there were many comments from people. There, we saw that people used it, and they they uh, they gave us uh, many comments, and many of them found that this is actually useful. I can I can use this. Um, so, so one of the use cases that Max was uh, showing up at that time was that there was this uh, analytics app, big analytics app that you had to 
deploy and then it typically took them days to get it running in a different setting, say in Amazon. It could be automated using alto cumulus to do it in hours. So, so that's one of these advantages of uh, using a middleware-based approach. But again, this is a very application-oriented perspective. That is, you are looking at deploying applications. You are looking at taking data snapshots. If you are looking at configuring your network, then no, because that's that's not really an application-oriented operation. So that's again the, the limitation when you think of this kind of middleware. Okay, so here's a quick view of what I've done apart from this one. So I had probably a lot of things uh, during my <laughs> this PhD life. So I worked on SourceDel and uh, SRS. This is on on annotations, and uh, you see these little stars that uh, this. Green one means publication, this one means a public or open source tool, and this one means a pattern. So we've had a lot of success with these ones as well as some of my early ones. So this is mostly work with Karthi Gomadam who, who left in 2009. And uh, uh, this is mostly realized, uh, Kino is mostly realized with uh, uh, former postdoc uh, uh, Priti Parikh which was applied in you know, sort of a, a biological concept of uh, context. And, and this is mostly work with Max at, at my IBM internships. So all of that, we had a lot of success. We had publications. We had tools that was either internally uh, uh, deployed within IBM, or in, in, in this case, in IBM shareable code, which was a mashup builder. We, we had it uh, running in. Uh, Alphaworks. So IBM Alphaworks is a site that gives public a view of what's coming up with our, in, in uh, IBM. So, okay, I think we are done. And this is uh, thank you, thank you all for, for you know helping me. So this is a collage of noises, and this is my committee. If you if I didn't mention it, so uh, Dr. Shah, Dr. Prasad, and then Dr. Matsudhir. Okay. okay so I have a simple question. Sure. So I want to uh, position your DSL work uh, with respect to some well-known languages for cloud programming. Uh -huh. So let's take Fig Latin. Okay. So so tell me where would you place uh, with respect to DSL? Um. So my question is coming from the following uh, perspective. Uh -huh. So if I have to program in Pig Latin, right? Right. I use uh, something similar to a relational model. Right. So I start thinking in terms of table, and then I have operations on table. Right. And potentially any domain that I can express in terms of tables and operations, I can, you can code it in, in yes. there. So so how do you rate that uh, in relation to your idea so, of DSL? So so in in my my view. The, the domain in domain specific language is of various granularity. So, so there are domains that are really, really restrictive or really high level. And then there are domains that are more broad. So if you, th if you think of the, the, the same, in the same line of thinking, if you think of MATLAB, let's say. MATLAB is still uh, considered a DSL because it, it's basically a mathematics uh, operational language, but it covers a huge range. And, and if you think of MATLAB's statistics toolkit, it's focused on statistics. So, so that you can think of a sub DSL, which is on a more restrictive domain. So how I place my work, let's say Mobile Cloud or Scale, uh, let's say Scale, Scale is the, 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 the more appropriate uh, comparison. If you think of Scale, then Scale is a, much higher level of abstraction because you are not thinking of the table model. You are not thinking of uh, columns. You are only thinking of uh, really high level operations. So, so basically you are saying some normalization. You are saying uh, uh, auto scaling. So that is, I think is the difference. So my work has looked at a really high perspective or, or really high, high, high level view of things. So the domains that I have selected are more restrictive, more closer to the domain experts. 
So, so if you th uh, if you think of it the other way, let's say we ask the biologist to to learn pig Latin. So he'll he'll have probably spend a month in doing that. Right? But uh, if if we ask so, him, so, so is pig Latin a target for your? Uh, it it can be a target. But but at least at this time I've uh, completely skipped that that intermediate piece and then gone straight down to the MapReduce uh, you know uh, generating uh, Java based code. So it's not as general purpose; it's more specific. Yeah, it's yeah. very specific. Um, the, the avoiding vendor lock-in right. is a risk consideration. You're trying to minimize the yes. risk of your Definitely. project. What is the risk if I go to DSLs? It's the risk is, as I was saying, you lose the flexibility, or you lose um, maybe in some cases you lose the use of certain specific features that may yield an advantage. So, so here's like I can. Um, let me think of an example. Um, so, if if you use a DSL, um, so if if you if you think of what we have, let's say, yeah, say actually, maybe, maybe let me help you out a little yeah. bit. So I, I think here the, the one of the standard questions that that is typically posed uh, for efficiency reasons is that when you go to DSLs, you do the least common denominator, right? And so you obviously abstract from very specific uh, infrastructure facilities that are provided uh, by different ones. And I think we discussed and we actually figured out that you can potentially have DSLs uh, also provide constructs where you can uh, plug in platform-specific uh, uh, equivalent details. Uh, that could be generated based on the platform that you're targeting. And some of those concerns can be taken care of also. So you can generate the, the from common things, you can generate for various platforms, and then you can also have fixed places where you can plug in platform-specific details right. and benefit from those. Yeah, so so that's one of the risks that were, people were concerned about, and I think there is some way out uh, of that. Yeah, like, like a concrete example, of like, Amazon releases new features, right? Now. If you use a DSL, right. none of those features will be available to you until the until, until you actually update the template. So, so one, one of the things I can think of is that the app generated right now uses, if you go for Amazon, it uses a script that actually, uh, I, I, I shouldn't say a script, it, it, it uses an AMI or Amazon Machine Image that has MySQL built in. And, and so it's, it basically initializes the database Runs the database script on the look on, on on the machine that you just uh, 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 started, and then connects to that database. Now Amazon, it's been a while now. Amazon came up with something called RDS, relational data sets. So now instead of having your own database, you could invoke a different service call to Amazon API and start a a MySQL or Oracle server. Just like that, so so what, that is not still available if you go through, uh, say, Mobi Cloud. So because the templates or the the process is not uh, not updated, so so you you lose that ability to do that. But still, your app will be functional, but it's not it, it may not be the, the, a, a very specific uh, you know feature that you uh, exploit on that cloud. We, we can go to uh, physics and many other disciplines where people are still using Fortran. <laughs> so once you yeah. solve their technical problem, uh, then you know those things often don't go away in many disciplines. So generally, the idea is, uh, if you are building mobile applications and the new mobile technologies keep on coming, you probably don't want to use DSL for that. But uh, if you are solving scientific problems uh, and you have uh, really uh, created uh, a whole library of uh, uh, processing mass spectroscopic uh, data or RT-PCR data, it's probably, and, and the scientists have related it using some of the real usages, then it's probably going to be useful and hopefully the whole community will be used for many years to come. So, 
So and in that context, uh, even some of the underlying cloud computational capabilities, you know, changes bigger and faster. Well, you can still use that, yeah. but functional changes would be difficult to come by. Yeah, I, I, when Dr. Prasad was mentioning, I, I remember that we had that question many times, right? So people, people asked when we demonstrated uh, tools, like, okay, so you can only support the, the, the features that are available in every cloud, right? So that's basically one of those questions that people come up with, and, and that is the case in, 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 in most times, but as Dr. Prasad was saying, you could have modifications that insert specific pieces of code at specific points that you know you can uh, have that as part of the DSL so that the, the app, let's say if you, when you are going for DAE, then there's a specific code that gets inserted into a specific point. So considering that to what degree this code transformation is bound to the specific uh, cloud service provider? Um, you, mean, you mean how uh, Generic is a template? Yes. I mean, yeah, template can be the generic, but the code uh -huh. transformers, which generates the code out okay. of that template, right. that should be bound to the cloud service provider. I mean, for example, if I'm using the Google App Engine, right. then there will be some data operation which includes the, some Google specific libraries. Right. right. So that, that should be, I mean, that should be taken care in those. Yes, so, so in, in, in Mobi Cloud, if you think uh, uh, if, if in the current setting, so if you, uh, uh, if you generate code for the app, there's something called JDO, Java Data Objects. So Google uses Java Data Objects, not JDBC, and no SQL, right? Uh, so the app, the, the, the transformers generate JDO objects for all the models and the code to actually write that to big table. This is completely different in EC2 setting. So it basically generates an SQL uh, set, uh, set. So it, it has the, the beams or the Java classes that uh, represent these data items, but they, there's a translator that actually converts that data items into a table and, and an SQL that actually writes and reads it. So yes, in, in a sense, they, they are pretty much bound, but that's the price we pay. So basically we, um, I, I remember Corey once was mentioning that the complexity in computer programming never goes away. You just move it from one place to the <laughs> other, right? So, so basically, we just moved that complexity re into the, the the templates. But again, I, as I was saying, that we, we see that it's not really difficult for you to act, actually make these templates because we 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 provided a. a, a, a significant chunk of the reusable templating engine. So, so if you look at the templates, they are basically like just files. So we have a whole bunch of uh, template uh, template engine written to, to process that. So how complex will it be to modify the uh, uh, transformers if new cloud service provider pops up and you want um, to that? Depending on your need, I don't think it's, it's, it's a lot. So I'll give you an example. So there was a guy, uh, Andrew Riddle, who was doing a project with me, right? And uh, basically what he, he did was he added a specific capability to Android to customize the UI based on a little CSS script that you will enter into the DSL. Andrew, he, he had a little knowledge on Ruby on Rails, and, and in one afternoon I, I you know, put the code up in the projector and showed him certain points saying, this is where you should look at, this is how it gets involved, and so on. Two days later, he said, I figured out where to put my modification. So, so, uh, so uh, he's, he's not an expert Ruby program. So in, in my sense, it's not that hard. It's, it's uh, you know, if you are a seasoned developer, it's, it's a pretty straightforward shot. So it, it's, that's how I would, but the, the issue here is that, these measures are subjective, right? It's it's very hard to get an objective measurement of uh, how how complex is this or how hard it is, unless it's for like uh, lines of code or anything, any such uh, uh, code metric. 
Yep. Any more questions? Do you have any plans of commercialization or maintenance? Um, very good question. So um, <laughs> we we have been trying to put this up as an open source project so up in GitHub. Uh, there are some some paperwork that I have to get around to do, and uh, because because it was built in right state mm -hmm. and using right state resources, right? Um, uh, there there is a, a, a process that I have to go through, but ultimately. I think the path to go, the right path to go, is to put this out to the community and let people play around with it and add, add details. So that is one one idea that actually came up with uh, came up in the, the Ruby competition as well. And they ultimately after the, the presentation, the question they ask is, what are your plans? Is this commercializable? Is this uh, is it going to be a product? And uh, so it seems that. At least in my mind, the right path is open source. I okay. Another thing for that is because as and when the features are updated in the cloud, people can whoever yep. Yep. wants those features can actually play around with this and all right. Add upon. All right. I think uh, thank you very much for the audience to join us, and we'll see you later on.